Hello and welcome to our podcast series by pacesdiaries.uk. This podcast is focused towards catering all the necessary information about MRCP UK and MRCP Ireland Paces examination for those who are preparing for the Paces and also for those who wants to know what MRCP Paces is all about. I'm your host Dr. Sophia Aldrin and today we will be discussing another topic in neuro with none other than Dr. Moses J Wesley. Dr. Moses, welcome again to our podcast series. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. We are going to have another exciting topic to discuss today in our Paces Diaries podcast series. Thank you. Yes, doctor. From today we will be discussing some of the topics which are termed as quite boring by many candidates including me. So many find it hard to understand as well. So let's make it fun, interesting and simplified. Our topic for today is ulnar nerve palsy. So doctor, why it is difficult to diagnose a case of nerve palsies in paces examination where exactly do you feel that things go wrong oh yeah that's a very appropriate question and i personally wanted to address that to all the candidates and paces aspirants just this nerve palsy if it comes it can be really tricky they'll get so confused seeing some wasting and some random pattern of sensory loss you know sometimes there can be some additional diagnosis rather than just more than one nerve involvement can be there and you will be asked to pick up in span of 5 minutes and then recollect the thought in 1 minute and present to the examiner that's all because neurology examination i would say finish within 5 minutes and recollect then only you will know where to localize the lesion and what to answer so if you are practiced enough you will do it the reason why candidates fail in peripheral nerve palsy is first thing they should know some basic anatomy of the crani- nerves it doesn't matter like cranial nerves or you know even the peripheral nerves they should know some basic anatomy they should know the anatomy of ulnar nerve they should know some anatomy of the median nerve where it goes from where it rises what it supplies and then even you know <clears throat> and the radial nerve as well so some nerves they should know the anatomy what i would suggest is radial ulnar median common peroneal and as well as you know your sciatic nerve at least know this then some cranial nerves at least cranial nerve 7 5 3 6 know some basic anatomy if they don't know the anatomy and they are going to enter there and they think they are going to diagnose some lesion they will be in trouble the wrist drop can be a cortical wrist drop it can be a component of some other disease seeing some wrist drop i cannot go ahead and tell that person has some radial nerve palsy then they will ask you to localize where it is what are the levels the injury can happen then complete blank the candidate will be at a complete blank i don't want that to happen so that's why we are going to simplify and clarify things in this podcast today absolutely agree doctor the key to succeed in this topic that is to be able to confidently examine localize the pathology and answer the examiner lies in the anatomy of the ulnar nerve if one is thorough with the basic anatomy just like you mentioned earlier then a case of ulnar nerve palsy is just a cake walk isn't it doctor absolutely absolutely they should know the anatomy they should be familiar with the anatomy not the complex anatomy just the basics from where it comes how it goes what it supplies that's it yes doctor so can you just take us through the uh, anatomy of the ulnar nerve oh all right it's a pleasure okay i'll just tell a couple of things the ulnar nerve it starts from c8 to t1 spinal roots all right then know the course know the root clear right now we know the course what is a course it arises from the medial cord then it descends between the axillary artery laterally and the axillary vein medially then it pierces the medial facial septum then it enters the posterior forearm through the ulnar tunnel what is an ulnar tunnel it's a space between olecranon and medial epicondyle at this level it gives an articular branch to the elbow joint once again i'm repeating c8 to t1 then it's descending between your axillary artery and vein then it's piercing the medial facial septum then it enters the posterior forearm through the ulnar tunnel okay this ulnar tunnel is a space between olecranon and medial epicondyle there at this point it gives an articular branch to the elbow joint i hope this is clear okay so what are the branches in the forearm 
okay in the forearm it pierces the two head of flexor carpi ulnaris it gives a muscular branch it innervates two muscles in the anterior compartment of the forearm then it gives a palmar cutaneous branch it innervates the medial half of the palm then it gives a dorsal cutaneous branch it innervates the dorsal surface of the medial one and a half fingers all right then what are the motor functions in the anterior forearm okay it gives supplies to flexor carpi ulnaris flexor digitorum profundus all right these are the two muscles the remaining muscles in the anterior forearm are innervated by your median nerve what is the action of flexor carpi ulnaris it flexes and adducts the hand at the wrist it flexes and adducts the hand at the wrist flexor digitorum profundus the medial half of it is supplied by the ulnar nerve where it flexes the ring and little finger at the distal interphalangeal joint okay then in the hand what it does it supplies your hypothenar muscles medial two lumbricals adductor pollicis palmar and dorsal intrusia of the hand just remember this that's enough then coming to the sensory supply this is very 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 important all right the palmar cutaneous branch innervates the medial half of the palm the dorsal cutaneous like i said dorsal surface of the medial one and a half fingers all right then superficial branch it innervates the palmar surface of the medial one and a half fingers so this is the ulnar nerve sensory area if you find any loss of sensation in this area then you should think of ulnar nerve palsy it's not done like that also you need to know where to localize the lesion just listen to the anatomy again note it down revise 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 see some diagrams try to draw some diagrams in matter of minutes you will understand what it is agreed doctor this has to be the most simplified version which is easy to remember and you know just appropriate for basis not just for basis i think like it's it's totally appropriate and easy to remember in in case of localizing a lesion and to know which nerve is involved where is the pathology as well so thank you for that uh, doctor uh, can you please guide us on some of the causes of ulnar palsy oh yeah that's extremely important because many people many times people think it's just an injury injury it's not the injury and the fracture alone causes okay we will divide the causes into three if there is any lesion at the level of elbow at the level of wrist or any peripheral neuropathy all right at the level of elbow if suppose there is an injury maybe if it can be due to some fracture can be due to some arthritis compression especially during general anesthesia all right there can be compression by the fibrous arch of flexor carpi ulnaris and the ulnar nerve then there can be lesion at the level of wrist like you know a ganglion you know it can be a tumor a fracture or an aberrant vessel all right an aberrant artery can cause that then again any cause of peripheral neuropathy including leprosy or any mononeuritis multiplex there is a huge list of causes for mononeuritis multiplex all these things can cause ulnar nerve palsy all right thank you doctor so i'm sure everyone are aware about the sequence of neuro examination if anyone has any doubts regarding the sequence you can always visit basisdiaries.uk and read about it or you can listen to our podcast series but there are certain examination sequence that has to be done in case of nerve palsies can you please guide us on the examination sequence of ulnar nerve palsy oh yeah i'll just tell a couple of things which a candidate should do all right so like i always say peripheral neuropathy pn means palpate the nerve if you don't palpate the nerve then you are going to lose your marks on physical examination skill also you may be losing your marks on identifying physical signs so palpate the nerve gently all right okay then you know the upper limb examination which we had already discussed and it's in our you know website once you've done the proper upper limb sequence then go ahead and see for two things first is a froman sign what is it typically if i'm going to give you a piece of paper just grab it just like that but what happens typically there is a muscle called adductor pollicis adductor means adduction and pollicis is your thumb all right typically if two of this muscles adductor pollicis okay and the first dorsal intrusia which adducts the index finger this two will act if i'm going to give a piece of paper and you will grab the paper from my hand all right so what happens in an 
ulnar nerve palsy okay the flexion of the thumb especially in the interphalangeal joint is done by a muscle called flexor pollicis longus typically it's supplied by the no so what happens when you're going to give a piece of paper and you ask the patient to hold between the extended thumb and the index finger if there is an ulnar nerve damage the grasp will be weak and the patient will flex the thumb at the interphalangeal joint to compensate the weakness because the interphalangeal joint flexion is carried out by flexor pollicis longus which is supplied by the median nerve so there will be flexion at the level of interphalangeal joint at the thumb and there will be loss of adduction this is called as Froman sign all right that's the first test the next test is called Wartenberg sign so what is a Wartenberg sign okay just ask the patient okay one more thing all this examination please keep a pillow in patient's laps if you fail to keep a pillow in patient's laps then it won't appear good and they can mark you against in any skill so keep the pillow ask the patient to keep the hand over there so how do you test a Wartenberg ask the patient to fully abduct the fingers and extend at the level of MCP DIP and PIP once again keep the hand over the pillow and fully abduct and extend at the level of MCP DIP and PIP at the same plane ask the patient now to adduct what will happen all the fingers will adduct but the little finger will go away in abduction that is a positive Wartenberg sign once again two important signs next week we will release videos of the signs you can watch in our YouTube channel and in our website Froman sign Wartenberg sign once again Froman sign Wartenberg sign Froman sign what will happen if you ask the patient to pull the paper that is going to be interphalangeal joint flexion at the level of thumb all right, this is due to weakness of the adduction due to ulnar nerve damage. And Wartenberg sign asks the patient to fully, you know, ask the patient to attack the fingers after fully stretched and extended. The little finger will go on abduction. This is a Wartenberg sign. These two are extremely, extremely important. And along with that, you always should see for thickened nerves look for fractures deformity scars arthritis extremely important all right extremely important thank you doctor so dear candidates in alna nerve palsy never forget to elicit these two signs from ensign and wartenberg sign and also palpate nerve so please remember this please keep revising this and also while you practice try to do this on a patient when you see these palsies so that you never forget doing it in the examination as well. So doctor, it isn't an uncommon uh, thing where a candidate is asked to localize the lesion. How to localize the lesion in case of an al ulnar nerve palsy? Yes, here comes the problem. Whenever you're asked to localize the lesion, candidates will be certified where to localize the lesion and what to do. All right, you can see a claw hand or you, can, you may not see a claw hand, like what to do, where to localize a lesion. All right, so to localize a lesion, you should first see for wasting the pattern of weakness. Okay, weakness first in the abduction, okay, and adduction, and then weakness in the flexion of the fourth and fifth MCP. Then what's, ha what's happening with the ulnar flexion of the wrist? All these things you should know okay all these things you should know suppose if there is a lesion at the level of elbow okay there can be wasting at the level of hypothene or eminence all right again a lesion at the elbow there can be weakness of fringer abduction and adduction and again weakness of the flexion of the fourth and fifth mcp can be there and weakness again at the flexion of fourth and fifth dip can be also there Again, ulnar flexion of the wrist will also be weak and sensory loss will be in ulnar distribution. This is if there is a lesion at the level of elbow. If the lesion is distal to the elbow, what can happen? Again, there can be wasting of the hypothene or eminence, finger abduction and adduction weakness will be there. But there won't be anything else beyond this. But sensory loss will be there in the ulnar distribution. This is point number two. Point number three, suppose if there is a lesion in the Guyan's canal, what can happen? 
there can be hypothena eminence wasting there can be finger abduction and adduction weakness and nothing else will be there there won't be any sensory loss in the ulnar nerve distribution ulnar nerve palsy can present without any sensory loss in the ulnar nerve distribution that is one of the important thing about localization next come to clawing okay many people think like if there is no clawing there is no ulnar nerve palsy is that no absolutely not all right so if there is a lesion at the higher level high ulnar nerve palsy there is not going to be any clawing it's called ulnar paradox so what is the mechanism of clawing why clawing of the finger occurs clawing occurs due to the weakness of extensor of especially fourth and fifth fingers okay ulnar clawing typically occurs when there is a lesion at the wrist suppose if there is a lesion at the elbow what can happen there will be weakness of both the flexors and extensors at the dip joint as a result of that there will be ulnar nerve palsy without clawing so don't get petrified if you don't see a clawing oh my god i didn't see a clawing so it's not an ulnar nerve palsy it's some peripheral neuropathy now know the pattern and know the mechanisms know some anatomy you'll be able to diagnose it easily absolutely doctor because it might sound a bit tricky and confusing while listening to all this uh, all this information about ulnar nerve palsy but yeah if one knows the anatomy properly and if you listen to this uh, explanation again and again, and if you're able to correlate both the things, then yeah, getting to know the pathology and to localize the lesion becomes quite easy. So, Doctor, now let's talk about the plan of management in Alana palsy. Yep. The plan of management, make it very, very simple here. Patient education, counseling, number one and number two. Then tell multidisciplinary team management. Okay. Then after that, if you want to talk about the investigations, please don't forget to include an X-ray of the limb in whichever area you feel the nerve is injured at, elbow, wrist. Then nerve conduction study if needed, an electromyography. If you are suspecting some other lesion, maybe MRI spine. Enough. At least tell these things. Then followed by that, you have to look out for certain things. Suppose you are finding some anesthetic patch and an ulnar nerve palsy, a thicker nerve, you have to tell investigations relevant to them. Maybe investigation relevant to leprosy or investigation relevant to some vasculitis, depending on that. Though that's why I always said you have every right to turn to the examiner and ask the history from the examiner in station three. You cannot ask a history from the patient, but you can ask the history from the examiner. And then after that, the treatment is going to be very simple. We from medical end are not going to do many of the things here. Even as a neurologist, I'm going to refer the patient to physiotherapist, occupational therapist, all right, some pain relief, analgesia, and treat the underlying cause, suppose a vasculitis or a leprosy suspect. That's it. Beyond that, you need not give any more information when it comes to treatment. Yes, doctor, agreed, because the plan of management has to be quite specific to the pathology that's given. So thank you. That was a great explanation. Is there anything that you would like to add up in this topic, doctor, that you feel we might have missed? Um, this should be fair enough for ulnar nerve palsy. If the candidate knows this, revise the anatomy once again and try to localize the lesion. Just note on what we have told you and then try to examine a patient, especially from a sign, you know, you know, your Wartenberg sign, and I'll try to do that on a patient. Or if you don't get a patient, try to do the sequence. Multiple times when you do, multiple times when you're going to discuss this with a colleague, in no time you will master this. And it doesn't matter whatever nerve pulses they're going to keep right in front of you. In just a matter of seconds, you will diagnose it. Yes, doctor, revision is the key. So keep revising and keep practicing all the sequences. Keep listening and keep doing again and again. So you that comes like, you know, as a reflex that you don't have to think about it in the examination. So thank you again, doctor, for this wonderful discussion on Allah nerve palsy. You really made it interesting to listen and quite easy to understand. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we will see you again with yet another podcast. Thank you. Yes. And dear doctors, we'll see you again in our next podcast series where we will be discussing about another important nerve, its pathology and everything that is important for PACES. Till then, keep listening to all our podcast series at PACESdiaries.uk and also on YouTube. So see you again. Take care. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you.